my name is Dr. Leila Esuhaj. I'm the director at Prevent Watch, and today I'll be chairing the discussion. Um, the format, intended format, will be that we'll each speak for 10 minutes. Um, well, our panel members will speak for 10 minutes. I'll try and speak for slightly less. Um, and you can ask the questions in the chat as we go along, or you can save them to the end and you can put your hands up and actually ask them. We are recording the meeting with the intention that we may uh, put it on the YouTube channel or something later on. Um, but I'll start today by introducing our panel members. So we have Professor John Homewood, who's Professor Emeritus at University of Nottingham. He was the expert witness for the defense um, of the teachers involved in the Trojan horse affair. And he's the co-author of the People's Review of Prevent and an advisor at Prevent Watch. We also have with us uh, Alba Kapoor, who's the head of policy at Runnymede Trust, um, which is the UK's leading race equality think tank. And she delivers large scale pieces of policy research and works to set out Runnymede's anti-racist agenda. She was the recipient of the Kennedy Scholarship uh, 2022 to 2023 at Harvard University. And we also have with us Sabah Hussain, who's the migration and citizenship team leader at Rights and Security International, working on issues to do with migration, citizenship, and the prevent strategy. And she's worked as a journalist focusing on human rights, civil society, and culture. So together and between us, we'll explore um, the significant most recent developments surrounding the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, or we might be referring to it as CERD, C-E-R-D, um, and their recommendation to suspend the UK's PREVENT program and consider uh, reparations for victims of PREVENT. So between us, we actually cover three of eight organisations that made submissions to this particular United Nations Committee. Um, and the other organisations included the Race Equality Network, Children's Rights Alliance for England, Muslim Women's Network, the Association for Defending Victims of Terrorism, um, and a consortium that was organised through the University of East London. Um, and today what we really want to represent is a slice of that bigger pie of evidence that was delivered to the UN specifically around why PREVENT has been so harmful in not only creating but reinforcing discrimination within the UK. Um, and our collective submissions to the UN, we believe, have culminated in this very powerful response from the UN that acknowledges these harms of PREVENT and insists on systemic change, not just to tinker PREVENT, but actually to suspend it, which is one of the strongest recommended, in fact, it is the strongest recommendation that has been put forward um, from any of the UK uh, UN uh, committees or the UN Special Rapporteurs. So this isn't the first time that PREVENT has been criticized by UN Rapporteurs or by UN committees. Um, they have been raising concerns from 2016 um, and they've made recommendations um, about, you know, with regards to these particular concerns, they've made recommendations in terms of what the UK should do. And of course, the UK has not listened. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this marks a very significant turning point, the fact that they have actually put forward this recommendation this time around to suspend prevent um, in terms of having that international recognition, because we know within the UK, um, the UK hasn't really listened to the UK civil society organizations. And so it's provided an opportunity for us to put this evidence forward on an international platform um, like the UN and really show that prevent is causing these harms and inequalities uh, across UK institutions. So it's no secret that, of course, prevent disproportionately focuses on Muslim communities, that prevent has fostered mistrust, that prevent has caused alienation of the Muslim community, that it's led to the justification of racial profiling every day within core institutions such as education, such as in healthcare. Um, and so today's conversation is about the gravity of these UN recommendations what it means for justice, what it means for accountability and the road ahead. Um, and we hope that this webinar can be something beyond just a reflection on the past and what we've put forward, but also can serve as a call to action um, as we continue pushing for change as a collective. Um, so we each have 10 minutes. Um, I will let Alba speak first, um, but just before Alba goes forward, just to clarify, I am chairing the event um, and John will put forward 
a lot of what Prevent Watch has put forward in terms of their submission. Um, but for those of you who are unaware in terms of what Prevent Watch does, we are an organization that supports people who have been impacted by Prevent. And to date, we've supported over 700 individuals, which meant that our submission to the UN was based on over 700 individuals that we've supported in the last 10 years. We put forward more evidence-based um, themes and details of the various testimonies that we received. For example, a 15-year-old girl who was referred to prevent simply for wearing a abeya, um, which is like basically looks like a dress, essentially, um, and for hanging around with more visibly Muslim peers within her school. She was actually referred to prevent, and this was only recently. This isn't like an old referral. So we put forward cases like that. Um, and we also delivered an in-person statement to the committee. Um, so John will go on uh, second, I believe, after Alba. Um, he was there in person at Geneva to um, speak to the committee in terms of the lack of accountability around prevent. Um, he will speak more about that. We were also fortunate enough to take a client with us to Geneva, who again, she delivered, she's a mother of an 11 year old who was referred to prevent. She delivered her evidence in terms of how damaging prevent was to her, how much money she had spent going around in circles, just trying to get some form of justice, which of course she never really got. Um, and we believe that it was through these submissions and through these in-person testimonies that the UN was able to um, come to the conclusion that not only should prevent be suspended, but actually that reparations should be considered for these, um, for these individuals who have been impacted. Um, so I will hand over to Alba, who will discuss um, the Running Me Trust uh, submission and maybe speak more um, about the UN and the process of these types of submissions. Great. Um, thank you so much, Leila, and thank you so much for having me today. Um, this is a sort of impenetrable process of a UN committee, and I'm so pleased that we've been able to get something so strong from them, and um, it feels like a real step forward. So what I can do is sort of ground a bit um, the work that we did at Runnymede in our joint submission with Amnesty in the context of our engagement with the committee in the past. Um, and then I also wanted to touch on what the concluding observations say and why they are so important. Um, and then I think this is this will be a space for discussion later on what we want to think about now, because obviously the next step is we've got this high level engagement and a really strong recommendation and set of recommendations. Um, and we've got to think about the opportunity that gives us to engage um, with the government on this. So to start with, um, this process has a sort of knotty history, especially in the last, over the last decade. Um, we at Runnymede um, have been responsible for putting together shadow reports to the committee uh, in, in its reporting periods, um, once in 2016 and again in 2021. And our 2021 submission um, was particularly uh, particularly controversial because it followed the commit commission on on race and ethnic disparities the notorious Sewell commission um, and we were very clear about the uh, reality and existence of institutional and structural racism in Britain um, and uh, the the submission that we released was released just four days after um, the sort of infamous euro racism imp incident um, of, of 2021 um, in which black British footballers were racially abused uh, at the euro final and it gained a lot of attention and uh, also some significant uh, sort of backlash and response from the government in what we concluded and highlighted. Um, the government then finally released their state report to the committee um, in 2023, and that report um, sought to sort of undo a lot of what we were talking about in relation to uh, structural and institutional racism. Uh, it really focused on the government's Inclusive Britain plan. Um, it made many claims around prevent and civil rights that I know John is going to cover later um, and it uh, it was something that we were really keen to counter and engage with in our own submission to the committee this time round. Um, and so the, the submission that we put together uh, we put together in in, in uh, alongside Amnesty International um, and it was endorsed by over 43 NGOs and civil society organizations. Um, 
we also held a series of roundtables with over 60 civil society organizations um, and what we saw was that we presented a sort of cross-sectoral vision um, we worked with migrants organizations and of course our principal partner in this was amnesty uh, which for runnymede a racial justice organization um, felt like a really important thing to think about how we engage with issues of civil rights because we knew that was going to be so critical um, in this iteration of our conversation with the committee um, and so we knew that this uh, submission would have to focus substantially on civil and political rights. Uh, we wanted to focus on the rollback of rights um, for, for people of colour in relation to the Nationality and Borders Act. Uh, we wanted to talk about the Illegal Migration Act. Uh, we wanted to highlight the rollback on protesting rights covered in the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act and, of course, attacks on protesting rights in the Public Order Act. Um, and, of course, we wanted to highlight the, the impact of the attack on civil rights, um, which have been part of the government's own prevent and extremism agenda. So our submission really talked about the life-changing impact that prevent has um, on people, uh, the impact on their mental health, the unmanageable financial cost associated with challenging referrals, worries over data and protection. Uh, we also want to talk about the chilling effect um, that Prevent has on legitimate forms of political expression, um, the poor transparency surrounding Prevent and barriers to redressing those impacts. And then we also uh, talked about the sort of hostility um, that the government has towards CSOs, organisations like our own, um, who are seeking to challenge uh, the, the discriminatory impacts of Prevent and criticise the way it's engaging with uh, communities of colour, Muslim communities in particular. We also, of course, highlighted the scandalous failure of the independent review of Prevent um, and uh, the government's uh, attempts to play it down to the committee, which I know John will cover later as well. Um, and then finally, we also wanted to touch base, of course, on the extremism definition itself um, and what that the implications that that had on the uh, and civil society and clamping down civil society and that's something that our submission really focused on throughout the board was the what ha what's happened over the past um three years which is of course um the the dampening of the voices of civil society whether it's an access to process protesting rights or in indeed the um uh, extremism definition itself um and i'm really proud of the submission because it took a really bold approach um we, we highlighted the urgency of scrapping these pieces of legislation. Um, we worked with the organization Release, who are fantastic on issues of drug enforcement and talking about uh, drug enforcement and the urgency of decriminalizing the possession and cultivation of all drugs of per personal use. Um, and we really took uh, sort of bold steps around um, the importance of thinking around abolition, of thinking around uh, scrapping and, and repealing these harmful pieces of legislation. Um, and for us, that was made possible by our partnership with Amnesty, but also by um, the work that uh, the kind of the notion of having this unity and solidarity with all of these other organizations who are also working in the space um, and the fact that the organization was bolstered by over 40 people and um, 40 organizations in sorry the submission was bolstered by over 40 organizations um, was really really helpful as well in that um, and then the fi final thing that I wanted to just touch on and I hope I've got enough time uh, is just what the concluding observation said um, so, of course, Leila's mentioned uh, the suspension of prevent and call for reparations as a massive step forward as part of these recommendations. Um, it also, of course, is critical for us, given the government's announcement of a new um, counterterrorism strategy and rapid review, and um, I think will be a, a really important basis for us, these UN recommendations, to um, engage on these questions and push for something meaningful um, when it comes to talking about the urgency of, of re repair um, for the harm that's been caused and of scrapping um, the dangerous prevent agenda. Um, it also had some other really important concluding observations. Uh, one of the things that happened in our trip was that we talked a lot about um, the impact of the race riots. And uh, we talked about the role in politicians and of rhetoric and of high profile public figures in um, the race riots and uh, in allowing this to happen. Uh, and that was a connection that was drawn on by the committee as well. They talked about the connection between public 
political rhetoric and um, the ra race riots. And we need to use that in our advocacy as well in the future. I think that's really important that we've got that from a UN committee. Um, there was also a lot of focus on the over-policing of schools um, and a call to explicitly prohibit strip searches on children. Um, that was a good step forward and, and I think a result of a lot of lobbying, especially by release um, in in Geneva itself um, and also um, the calls that we put together in our submission as well. Um, there was a real recognition of the importance of affirming protest rights and access to civil society um, and to civil, civil society engagement. Uh, so the committee recognised um, the importance of amending the Police Crime Sensitivity and Courts Act, we of course call for scrap, but also the Public Order Act um, and the importance of the right to freedom of, of peaceful assembly. Um, and finally, the other thing that really came out of the concluding observations for me was um, the importance of redress. And this is something that was covered in Prevent um, and, and the government's uh, calling for redress and the harms uh, push, put forward by the Prevent agenda, but also within the criminal justice system as a whole. It really recognised the institutional racism uh, within policing and the criminal justice system um, and it really called for effective rem remedies for families who were affected uh, by discrimination um, from authorities as part of, of the committee's recommendations. And the final thing, of course, is that the committee really focused on issues around the legacy of colonialism and um, slavery and Br Britain's past, uh, imperial past in, in its present. And again, that's something that we should feel emboldened by and draw on in our work and advocacy work going forward. And that's, of course, of, of relevance to um, all of the conversations that we'll have today. Um, so as I, just to conclude, um, that was it. the submission covered a lot um, and so did the concluding observations and they were really strong and powerful us, for us and we are at this critical juncture. Um, the previous government was determined to downplay the UN um, and did so in many different ways and um, in its relation to the committee, in its uh, commitment to, to producing reports, etc. Um, this government, there might be a window of opportunity for us to engage on these issues and using that solid basis of UN experts in our work um, will be really forward going forward. And I think we should use the sort of radical agenda that's been pushed forward in our submissions um, and in some of the, the words of the committee to really um, lobby and advocate high, hard on, on what we really believe is important around the prevent agenda and beyond. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Alba. Um, I think it was really good to hear about all of the different uh, topics that were actually put under the nose of this particular committee. Um, and I think one of the things that came out and, and we were pleasantly surprised with was the fact that they did put prevent on their agenda, even though it wasn't initially one of their priority concerns. It did, by the end of it, make a, a, a very strong recommendation on it, and it ended up being of concern. Um, to this particular committee. So I will pass over to John to highlight perhaps also why that ended up being the case. <laughs> okay, um, thanks very much. That was a really superb uh, account, uh, Alba. Not sure there's very much uh, to add, except to say I think what it did show was how effective we were in terms of the coordination of groups and also the importance of having multiple groups there. It was a very difficult event in order to get in. There was both the formal presentations and then when there was informal uh, discussions and responses to, uh, to questions from the committee on the, on the following day. And it wasn't clear that we were going to get Prevent up the agenda, but I think it was the way in which Prevent uh, provide, provided an example of wider difficulties and problems that the committee was involved in. So Alba has mentioned the um, issue of over-policing or policing with, within schools. We were able to indicate that that policing was not only about, if you like, uh, uh, physical strip searches, but also mental strip searches through uh, prevent and prevent referrals. And I think that was very effective, particularly in the context of, uh, of the, the, the client of Prevent Watch who came and gave, I think, a really moving account of the experience of her child within a, a, a school that really gave the lie to any idea that 
the, the government might have, as Shawcross put out, that prevent was light touch. So I think it was very vivid to the committee that what looked like, you know, maybe just uh, uh, interviews or uh, you know a, a bit of inquiry into concerns could be deeply traumatic uh, for children and for their parents, and that there was no real risk at the back of it. I think they also appreciated that prevent was some very considerable distance from uh, uh, any actual commission of uh, criminal uh, acts. So I think that uh, that uh, that coordination was effective. And it was also very difficult because the committee also uh, had frustrations with the way in which they were having to address uh, UK-wide issues, English uh, issues of the different jurisdictions, and prevent uh, didn't operate in the same way across all of them. And so one of the things that they were urging, which I think is uh, one of the ways in which we ought to start lobbying as well, is that the UK government has a wider responsibility to ensure not that there's a minimum standard across the different jurisdictions, but that there is a, uh, an exemplary standard for human rights, civil rights, and so on across the different jurisdictions. And in that context, it is particularly England where the which has the uh, least developed uh, 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 development of the the kind of the uh, practices that the, the UN was looking for. And I think that's also uh, a should be a wake up call to the Equalities and Human Rights. Uh, commission as well, because it has bears some responsibility for ensuring those rights. Uh, it's noticeable that the uh, Equalities and Human Rights Commission has not addressed any prevent issues at all, and didn't even make a submission to the Shawcross review. I think the committee, although it's far too polite to say so, has been very frustrated about the curve Conservative government's response, and in fact, their uh, response to the in to the uh, report, which was part of what we were uh, discussing, was serious. Not only inadequate, but in terms of uh, prevent, seriously misleading. They, for example, stated it came under the remit of the independent reviewer of terrorism, which is false. They talked about, um, uh, you know, they, they talked about reviewing Prevent, but didn't mention uh, the Shawcross report. So it was um, woefully inadequate, as well as being misleading. And then I think one of the consequences of the uh, of the power of the submissions was that when the state party, so called, was um, uh, called to answer questions, they were really shocked by the nature of the uh, challenges they got. So, I mean, some of them, which if I were a government representative, I'd be deeply embarrassed about, was saying that, yes, we conducted public sector equality assessments of all aspects, and it's mandatory to do so. It's just that it's not mandatory to publish them. And uh, that just created complete astonishment within the, the committee that the government would say, well, we've done the reviews, but we've not let anybody know about what the reviews uh, found. So I think they gave us an opportunity and they did so very deliberately. Obviously, they were quite, um, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they found the riots that had preceded their discussions really were quite challenging in terms of the sorts of questions they needed to ask. But they were also conscious that it was a new government. So I think partly the radical nature of their recommendations is you've got a new government, we're going to give you 
the means of doing it, you have as civil society organizations persuaded us of these serious uh, issues, now you've got to take that to you've got to take that to government. And for me, it's quite worrying that we, I mean, uh, 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 as Albert said, that there is a rapid review uh, of extremism taking place, but it's a rapid review of extremism that seems to have caught the conservative government disease, and that is forgetting that they've already been one and forgetting what you said as an opposition during that review, forgetting that there's a Shawcross um, report with every one of its recommendations in the process of implementation. So I think we've got to find ways of getting into that review. But as far as I can tell, I don't know whether Alba has a, a different uh, view on it, but uh, it's not going to be a public review. It's going to be an internal review within the Home Office. And consequently, all the normal suspects will be lined up uh, trying to undermine uh, the UN uh, recommendations. So I think it's really important that we press and also take heart from the fact that the kinds of coalitions and views we put together, the consistency across all our uh, submissions is actually the best evidence for why uh, successive governments have got this wrong. I'll just uh, stop there and pass on to Saba. Thanks. Thank you, John. Um, I think you, what you highlighted quite nicely is just how difficult it is for anyone, you know, whether it's within the UK or even on the UN platform, to get any information um, and transparency when it comes to prevent. Um, and I know that Rights and Security International have done a lot of work around prevent and especially within trying to get information in terms of like FOIs, etc. Um, so, yeah, I will pass on to Saba from RSI to speak about their submission. Thanks, Leila. I might fall short of 10 minutes. I think my colleagues have um, already established a lot of the crucial points and to do with the submission and to do with the, the event in Geneva. And I need to commend them for the incredible work they did on the ground and their continued work on this as well. Um, when RSI addressed the UN Committee on the political issues of racial discrimination, we highlighted the need for legislative reforms in the UK and our submission called attention to three issues. So the government's looking powers to revoke citizenship, the misuse of the common travel area in the UK and the Republic of Ireland, and then obviously we emphasise prevents disproportionate impact on Muslims, people of colour and other minority groups. And these are systematic failures, systemic failures that fundamentally undermine the principles of fairness that the UK has committed to uphold in these various conventions. And the committee hasn't overlooked these issues and has previously reflected on prevents bubbling effects as Lena addressed at the beginning in its last report. And we thank the committee for its particular focus on the UK's anti-terrorism policies. Because prevent has transformed into a tool that police has thought that stifles free speech and disproportionately targets already marginalized communities. Muslims, people of color and other minority groups to bear the brunt of this very flawed system with no effective oversight or meaningful evaluation of its impacts. And it's a policy that fosters discrimination under the guise of security. It weaponizes fear and suspicion against people who are already vulnerable. And the violent, Islamophobic, racist, and anti migrant riots of the summer painfully reestablish what we've known for so long about the vilification of minority communities that our state policies only exacerbate. And these intrusive measures are implemented with an alarming lack of transparency and accountability. And that's one of the points that RSI has focused on last year. Despite repeated recommendations from the committee and civil society organisations, the government has refused to establish effective monitoring mechanisms or safeguards against abuse. And the committee noted that it further recommends that the state party ensure there are effective and independent monitoring mechanisms, as well as sufficient safeguards against abuse of the existing measures, and the people affected are given adequate reparations. But we know from our freedom of information request over the last year that the police and the government do not systematically collect or store information about the racial identity of people who prefer to represent. This is not an oversight, it's a deliberate choice. The Home Office of the former government has explicitly admitted that the racial data it holds is incomplete and potentially inaccurate. And the police have failed to recall the racial identity of nearly two thirds of over 50,000 people who prefer to prevent since 2015. And this is unacceptable in any policing activity, let alone one with such grave implications for civility, for civil liberties. And we also published reporting in 2022 that the UK's handling of personal data under the 
is illegal under the European under the European Convention of Human Rights, and at minimum, the treatment of personal data under the event is not based on clear and accessible laws and regulations regarding how government bodies may gather, store, share, and otherwise process data, which violates Article Eight of the Convention. And our research shows that prevent has created an atmosphere where self censorship has fested, where students are unafraid to join activist movements, and where communities feel under constant surveillance. And this isn't just a failure to protect, it's an active harm to the members of our society. The irony here is that prevent, the prevent duty doesn't even apply uniformly across the UK. In Northern Ireland, where we do a lot of work, a region with its own history of violence linked to political beliefs, the prevent duty is conspicuously absent, which begs the question why are Muslims in Great Britain treated as a greater threat? The disparity is glaring and it only serves to confirm, confirm what we already know. That prevent isn't about security, it's about control. Our findings in our report preventing dissent suggest that, that while the government's use of the strategy continues to disproportionately impact Muslim communities, and the targeting of so called non violent extremism is also producing an environment in which people from non Muslim backgrounds are also losing their ability to engage in non violent protest and civic action without fear of harms. A document from an online prevent awareness training also includes our believing in socialism, communism, anti fascism, and anti abortion a list of potential signs of ideologies leading to terrorism. And so the extent to which prevent goes is ludicrous. We need to continue to demand the suspension of prevent and insist on transparency to hold our leaders accountable to ensure that no one is targeted because of who they are or what they believe. The committee also called for suspension of the prevent duty. And as touched on this briefly, what's crucial is that the role of the police in the prevent duty and the referral practices from public sector bodies needs to be removed it redirected to safeguarding health professionals without involving criminal measures in spaces where they're not needed if there's no concrete evidence of violence or harm. And this is one of the points we're aiming to address with the new Labour government. And we're very lucky, all of us, to be united in the tireless work of dedicated campaigners, activists and academics and organisations that have brought these injustices to light. And this really does show that change is possible when we stand together. And I think the tireless work of our communities and our activists will continue. I'm hoping that they continue to lead to strong recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sabah. Thanks for that. And thank you to everyone else who um, spoke to Alba and John as well. So um, just for some context, um, the UK is a member of the UN and it's expected to uphold certain human rights standards. And when the UN flags a problem, it should create a sense of urgency for the UK government to make changes. Um, and so now that the UN uh, said have put forward these recommendations, the UK government is obligated to respond um, within the next year. So we await their acknowledgement um, and potential action on these concerns about the prevent duty. They have been very long standing concerns. Um, it's interesting because a week prior to these recommendations um, being published by the UN, um, the new Labour government did uh, announce that they want to start looking at misogyny as a form of terrorism. And of course, if misogyny is seen as a form of terrorism, that would then mean um, that would also impact downstream in terms of what prevent is and what is seen as extremism. Um, and so we may see more children, for example, being caught up and being accused of being potential misogynists in the future. And therefore, if you're a potential misogynist, then you're a potential terrorist and also being caught up in prevent as well as, of course, even more severely, if they're seen as terrorists, that's, of course, worse in terms of how the threshold for, for CT legislation um, is going to be passed down. So it is quite worrying. And we do hope that, um, you know, one week later, these UN recommendations were put forward and maybe it will allow this new government to uh, rethink its strategy going forward in terms of, um, you know, bulldozing any more um, counterterrorism legislation uh, without those thoughts and without those considerations. I don't know if there are any questions. I can't see any questions in the chat at the moment. Um, but if there are any, feel free to pop them in the chat or just raise your hand um, and ask. Um, While we're waiting for people to think of their questions, um, I don't mean to put you on the... Okay, there you go. I was going to put someone else on the spot, but that's fine. Um, Becky, you've got your hand up. Feel free to unmute. 
your mute, Becky. Sorry, hi. Um, sorry, I was really struggling with that. Um, my name is Becky. I work for Kim Johnson, who's the MP for Liverpool Riverside, um, who sends her apologies for this meeting. Um, she's not able to attend, but um, I wanted to ask about the rapid review for the home, the internal Home Office um, review of count of the terrorism legislation, counter terror legislation, um, because Kim can ask um, through through parliamentary sort of structure. She can ask questions. Um, to ministers, either written questions which they're obligated to respond to, or she can bring things up in the chamber. So I wanted to see if anybody on the call or any of the speakers had any um, sort of ideas of ways in which we can we can engage with that and ask questions. If you've got any questions, we can obviously pick them up and, and reflect them just to learn a little bit more, maybe about the terms of reference, um, um, who's involved, etc. Um, and to kind of push for more public um scrutiny and engagement with that with that review um because obviously we share your concerns that um this, this these reviews just kind of re reinvent themselves and reinvent the same sort of narrative um so yeah i'd be really really keen to hear thoughts on that and if there's anything we can do to help obviously please let us know brilliant thank you uh becky alba john sabah do you have anything just make one quick response. I think the real danger of an internal Home Office review is the last government place changed the um, status of the Commissioner for Counter Extremism. And so we have in place the person who guided the uh, Shawcross review and is responsible for the implementation of its recommendations, Robin Simcox, sitting in the Home Office with the central responsibility for it. And I think it's really urgent uh, to get across to the minister and others involved in the review that the UN um, criticisms, and they're more extensive than simply the cr criticisms contained in the paragraph of recommendations, that the person in charge of prevent at the Home Office is the uh, Commissioner for Counter-Extremism, Robin Simcox, and he's the architect of nearly all of the things that uh, uh, are being uh, criticised. So I don't think we as organisations would have much confidence in a review that placed him at the heart of it. Obviously, he's going to have opinions that would be put into a review, but in a sense, he's been pushed into to that position. And it's interesting that Sarah Khan, who you, I mean, I think most of us have uh, reservations about Sarah Khan as well, but as a figure, she's been, she, you would expect her to, to be received more sympathetically by the Labour government, considering their, the nature of the things they've said about misogyny and so on. But she is no longer an advisor, so has, in a sense, been removed from that position of influence while I've been silent about Robin Simcox. Alba, Sabah, do you have anything to add? The just only thing... Said, oh, sorry. Um, sorry, I'll go ahead. No, I was just saying no, th thank you, Becky. That, I mean, that sounds like a fantastic opportunity, I think. It is a real opportunity with the with the new government that you know I think with the previous government we just so for so long just really hit a brick wall when it came to recommendations and prevent and now we've got this this massive window of opportunity to really be able to influence this change so I think we'll definitely I mean, we'll discuss how to be in touch with you about that and please feel free to drop um your email in a, in a DM or to email Layla or email whichever email came to you to send you a link to the event and we'll definitely get in touch thank you so much. Yeah, I think that would be good. We can follow up, Becky, um, afterwards, because I, th I think there are some other organisations as well that we could always always link you in with um, to get more on that. Thanks. Um, Nadine, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Hi, Nadine Greshi for the Racial Equality Network uh, here with Homer. Um, Homer attended the actual sort of United Nations Committee uh, and presented uh, our report as well there. Um, I think my question was, it, it's fantastic we've got this opportunity now to um, really influence the government. But for me, I, I think, uh, I don't know whether there's any mileage in prevent just producing some perhaps guidance for organisations around the country, uh, prevent watch uh, for around the country to, you know, what our role, define what our role could be in terms of putting 
adding to that pressure on the government and influencing that change and bringing it to bear. So whether it's at a national level, collective level, what, what could we do perhaps at a collective level nationally? And what can we do individually, locally? You know, even things like sort of saying, get in touch with your local MP or, or whatever, but producing some kind of a, a guidance. Center. But it just helps in terms of influencing the government all that bit more if there's a lot more voices being raised in a, in a coordinated way and perhaps being led through yourselves as Prevent Watch. So just thoughts, really, what, what your thoughts would be on, on that. Hi, Alba and John. Great to see you guys again. <laughs> um, I mean, I think any type of, of collective action has always been good. Um, we have been trying to coordinate um, with more organisations because we realise there's so much overlap. Um, and it's definitely something that we can discuss um, perhaps after um, this call as well um, and see who else would be would be willing to kind of engage on that. But yeah, I think that's a good idea. John. Could I just make a point to, to Becky that would be useful to um, communicate to her MP and other MPs? And that is there's a real risk for the Labour government here. And the risk is you hold an internal review and then the outcome of the review goes public. And then what you get is the critics from all the groups who are very knowledgeable about prevent, very knowledgeable about the counter extremism space. This is what happened with the Shawcross review. The Shawcross review was conducted in a way to exclude it, exclude not just civil society groups, but instead, in, but including other groups, and any group that had made a critical comment about uh, prevent. So I think by be opening the review, if you like, to the critics, would be really politically smart uh, by the government. And it would also require the people who are going to be giving the, putting the other position forward to be able to justify it in a, uh, a context of, uh, uh, of proper argument and debate. I'm pretty sure, for example, that the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation does not like prevent and doesn't like the fact that prevent is part of contest and not under his uh, jurisdiction. So that there are spaces there that we could push forward. I mean, um, the UN called for the suspension of prevent, not its abolition. Many of us are in favour of its abolition, but we might end up with something different from its abolition but, uh, that removes some of the serious uh, uh, injustices that are involved in, in prevent. And I, I think that's what the review offers as a possibility. But I think the government might avoid, you know, might, in a sense, uh, uh, avoid that, or try to avoid. Go ahead, Alba. Um, yeah, I just, I think there's something really important about that kind of point more generally, Nadim, about the importance of this kind of utilising spaces for collective action, and that's what the UN submissions did there was something really powerful about the way that we were able to coordinate and build together and I think there was like there was so many aspects of the diversity of the groups who came including regional diversity uh, different groups representing different communities and I think it's really urgent that we kind of re replicate that as much as possible so I think as a sort of takeaway point from this conversation um, and thinking about the future of coalitions around prevent but also the other issues raised by the committee as well I think it's important that we can think about that as an action for the future um, as a sort of result of this conversation as well um, also hi Hama. Just to add as well that um, so one of our teams at RSL we've been in contact with um, some representatives from from the government about kind of potential recommendations and alternatives to prevent and one of the things that we're proposing trying to propose with feedback from um, a few other organisations including including Prevent Watch including um, Amnesty is that a violence prevention mechanisms will really need to meaningfully engage with a diverse range of UK communities and society organisations that's one of the elements in our recommendations. And that includes the scoping phase, the design phase of any violence prevention program, 
because there are all these organizations and communities that have been tirelessly working on prevent for so long and but past strategies have just disproportionately focused on Muslim communities and kind of just like and fed into them but that fed out and there isn't there hasn't been any comprehensive engagement and so that's one thing that we're definitely featuring and um, hope to take forward and um, just a point that's being made in in the comments it's worth worth highlighting yeah it is a, a seismic kind of position we're at right now. I mean, people have been involved in this space will know the policy from 20 years ago uh, and 10 years ago from when it became a statutory obligation on, on the public sector. And in that time, you've got voices kind of growing and, and, and kind of sharing some of the cases that have come out in the public domain. But there's always been you know, it's a it's kind of a, a victim kind of uh, speech and, and, and all has been dismissed so now to have a platform like like the un come out is 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 quite seismic and as a, a, a from an advocacy perspective and campaign perspective to be able to just reference that as reasons for challenging uh, in the workplace or indeed in and in, into the public sector uh, 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 employees kind of workspace as well then that becomes an amazing reference point that we've just not had previously in this campaign so it is I think really, really important, and as somebody said, was being part of this campaign. It's, it's probably a, a point to, to celebrate that that has been achieved uh, by by the collective and should be recognised like that. Uh, the question was about local authorities and making them aware, but just generally making uh, public sector, uh, the unions, and other people who are effective, who are you know, the, we say a million plus people have been uh, trained in prevent. Um, and well, then you know, have this obligation on them, getting making them aware of it and allowing them to push back. Uh, in, in light of this, is probably an, uh, an aspect that we need to think about. Yeah, thanks. And if there are connections that we can make, and people have those connections where we can make more bodies or unions or local authorities, um, uh, either you know, we can either brief them ourselves or we can send them submission or we can send them some kind of memo or briefing then we're happy to do that. Um, I think part of the issue is just making sure that we have those networks. And I think between us, we do have the networks. It's just joining those dots up together. Um, are there any more questions? And there's a question in the chat about the sort of efficacy of the UN more generally, um, Smiller's question, um, which I think is a really important question. and. Um, yeah, so just wanted to flag that. Yeah. Um, does anyone want to answer that? So given the impact, it says, I wonder if the government will take the conclusions or recommendations seriously, given the lack of any real practical impact that the UN has had on the Gaza crisis, the ICJ and the ICC have had very little impact in terms of shifting UK policy on support for Israel. So I think, yeah, firstly, generally in terms of, you know, does the UN recommendations actually have any impact? Um, it's supposed to have impact, but we know from past experience that um, many of these recommendations have fallen on deaf ears. Um, and it's not just with regards to prevent, but many other policies and many um, other harsher points that have been put forward, um, you know, whether it's on Palestine or anything else, have also just been completely ignored. So, I mean, I don't know if anyone else has anything more positive to add to that, because it's well one of the things about prevent is that it's been sold on the international platform as kind of a front runner gold standard best practice etc cetera, etc cetera. so to have an international platform to call it out and call for its suspension and reparations at least in the international context should have amazing a, a huge impact right we were we've always been kind of bemused about how people like I won't name people, but certain people in the Home Office uh, have got lots of visa stamps in their passports going around selling Prevent to other countries as, as gold standard as well. So, you know, all this noise was being made in the UK. Now I think it's been made on an international platform. We can we can definitely put a damper, damper on that with other countries. I think that would be a good start. That is an important point. I think even if the UK government doesn't take up the recommendations, at least we can maybe help prevent other countries from looking at it as the... Um, model the model of how to deal with extremism how to prevent terrorism because it's not the model um, and also I guess even if the UK government doesn't take it on board it also raises awareness to people who maybe were slightly less familiar with the harms of prevent 
um, and get more people on board in terms of challenging it from from within the UK, whether that's within civil society or other organisations um, as well to make our, our voice slightly stronger. So that's a good point, I guess. Alba and Sabah, want to come back in with some concluding comments? We've just got five minutes left. Go for it, Sabah, and then Alba. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think on the point about the UN recommendations, I think what's really important is just strategic advocacy and coming at this from like lots of different angles. And we've seen from UN recommendations, obviously, they're, they're very strong. And whether they alone will have an effect on what happens with prevent, we don't know. But I think with, for example, kind of proposing these PMQs, proposing like having these UN recommendations, having civil society organisations come together and, you know, and present you know, all of their findings, all of their evidence. I think the purpose behind strategic advocacy is really trying to just, yeah, like I said, come at it from whatever angles we can and try to have the effect we can. So I think we need to, especially with the opportunity we have, I think we need to not lose faith and hope and, and just keep going really. I'm kind of a bit wishy-washy. <laughs> I think that's my general sentiment. Thanks, Emma. Alba? Yeah, I think it's a really, just on that question, I think it's a really important question. And it was something that we came up against a lot in kind of putting together the submission. Many organisations uh, were sort of saying the same refrain, which is, why would we want to make a sort of advocate towards the UN? The UN has failed in so many ways, especially around uh, uh, the genocide in Gaza. And I think that the the critical thing for me about this process is that it enables us to have spaces like this and enables us to kind of build cohesive uh, demands and recommendations and positions um, as kind of a cross civil society perspective. Um, and to then kind of reach that towards a high level is, is critical for our work. And I agree, I think we have to use all of the levers available to us. This is one of the levers. Um, it does come, I think we are at an important juncture uh, following the race riots, following um, this sort of international uh, uh, sort of shock at, at what had what happened uh, in, in August in, in the UK. And hopefully um, that will ground these UN recommendations in more credibility with the government. And I think we have to think about that in, in those terms. So not only are we able to build kind of cohesive solidarity between organizations as a result of this process, but there is more opportunity, more chance now than before um, to, to use these recommendations and sort of recognize that they do hold power because they are um, by, their, by their own terms, in their own terms, in their own context, quite radical. Thank you. Um, I can see there are quite a few links in the chat in terms of various reports, um, which you can go and have a look at if you're interested. Um, there, don't seem, there doesn't seem to be any more questions. I think there are quite a few people who want to um, follow up directly. So please feel free to um, drop us an email or you can drop an email to contact at preventwatch.org and then I can link you in, whether it's to other panel members or to John or Alba or Sabah. Um, if you'd like to follow up with them or any other of the organisations that we mentioned. Um, and please do sign up to the newsletter at Prevent Watch because we try to keep it as up to date as possible in terms of all the um, progress or all the setbacks that we see when it comes uh, to Prevent. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for, for taking the time out and conscious of the time. We're just coming up to the hour. So thank you for, for joining. <laughs>